So good morning everybody. My name is Anna Champion. Um, I'm the founder of a company called The Talent Lighthouse and I'm here to moderate what's going to be an amazing panel. We're waiting for our last panelist who's just been running in. Um, but I'm just going to briefly introduce everybody um, and then um, if you want to have more details on them, um, please do look in the, the book list that you've got. So, our great panel, we have Mitya New, who's the Managing Director of Leading Organisations. Jane Morgan, who's the Managing Director of Hong Kong from Golin. Um, we've got Dr. Bradley Hall, who's the Senior Advisor from Human Resources, Huawei Technologies Company. And last but not least, Bernard Kalti, um, from Founder and CEO of Most Engaged Consulting. So today we're going to talk about the global mindset building a workforce that can deliver beyond Hong Kong. Um, all of the panellists have lots of information they want to share, and so we're going to actually start with a bit of instruction from each of them um, about this topic and the thoughts they had. So, I believe it's ladies first to Jane. Um, hello everyone. So I'm Jane, I'm the MD of Golin in Hong Kong, and Golin is an integrated marketing uh, agency. We are a global agency, we have 55 offices around the world and over 1,700 employees. And in Hong Kong we have 35 employees, most of which are female. Um, average age is about 28, but unfortunately I'm not in a bracket and neither is my leadership team. Or fortunately, it depends on my living. Um, and we've got international clients such as Shell, Visa, Huawei, um, Fox International Networks, a whole host of, um, of international clients. Um, and so I was really interested in this panel because we, a global mindset, um, you'd argue, is something that you need for those, for those clients. Now, I also think I've been invited to this panel because of the journey that I've been on um, in the last just over 12 months. So I took over just over a year ago and have been um, in talent hell. And I'm looking at Emma Dale, who's sat here, <coughs> excuse me, at the front, who is prospect recruitment, because she's been on that journey with me and is part with a very irate Jane when I've been screaming, where's the bloody talent? Um, and the last three hires that I have made have all been, uh, or none of which have been in Hong Kong. So the last three hires for the leadership team are the leader, uh, the head of corporate, who is from Singapore, who brought over from Singapore, the head of consumer, who's from New York, uh, and just recently the head of digital, who is from Dubai. Now that's something that I don't, I, I wish wasn't the case. I wish the, the talent was here, but we have been looking for so long, it comes to a point where we, we've got to widen the search. Um, something that I, <coughs> excuse me, really believe in is that this might actually be our fault as a company. Um, and I think we all need to look at the training that we're giving. <clears throat> because if we were giving the right training, then you'd have so much talent to choose from. And so something we have done globally is really look at ourselves and look inwardly. So we have done a few things to try and rectify um, what we think is the issue. So travel, we believe, is, is fairly key to having this <coughs> excuse me, global mindset. So uh, we have spoken before about, you know, is it that you need American educated um, talent? And I actually don't think that that is the case because that's just, you've got one country and then you're coming to another country. I think just having that desire and finding those people who have the desire and passion to want to learn and helping them to learn and helping them to travel and understand different cultures and understand different economic situations would be key to that. So, a few things that we've done um, that we find are working, um, one of which is our training program. So in Hong Kong, we launched a training program, um, a brand new training program this year, and we looked at why people weren't training, and some of it was just, we don't have time, we're also busy, and you give it to us last minute. We've answered all of the questions that we genuinely asked the teams um, and got the answers to, so, and that's gone really well. It's gone so well that we've now doubled the investment um, in training this year, and we are just developing a bespoke um, training um, uh, program that will look at 
So we have all different types of levels. So you have associate, you've then got manager, senior manager, director, ED. All of those people have very different needs and um, training needs. And so one training program isn't going to cut it. So we have the training program where we spoke to that individual, depending on what level they are, um, what community that they're in, what excites them about the job and what they want to learn. So you might have someone in, um, in our corporate practice who really is excitable about digital, but we haven't given them that opportunity because we've boxed them in to this corporate role. So they will be able to pick and choose, and then we will also input, so we're training them to do what we need them to do for our clients, but they also have training that really keeps them motivated. So training program is one. The other one is a scheme called um, the Unturnship. Now the Unturnship is, again, a, a global program, and we give um, interns the opportunity, who work with us, um, the opportunity to submit some work, um, almost like a thesis, and then they get interviewed, there's a whole process, and then we choose someone to come and work with us full time. But before they do that, we send them away for two months to travel the world. And we work with them on where they're going to go and what they want to learn and how that's going to benefit Berlin and Berlin's clients. Um, and they give it a task. So that recently, um, somebody went away and I don't know how they did this because I couldn't cope, but God love um, a millennial with this. Went away for two months without their mobile phone. And so they had to go into a web, you know, a web cafe and they were sending reports and blogs. And that is actually, you know, um, a pretty difficult thing to do. But it really got them thinking about technology and they've just got this huge wonder and world of insights now. And that person is so psyched about working at Berlin um, and has learned so much that they've come back and taught everyone else and spoke to everybody else about the wonder of travel and why we should do it. So travel and giving that opportunity is very important to us. Um, so there's the internship. We also have, um, and I know there's some lawyers um, in the room, and I always get asked the question, how does this work and things must go wrong, but we have unlimited holiday leave. Now that's not something that we just say and, and um, we really do live by it. And you have some people who take and last time I was on a panel, actually, I was asked the question, has it impacted? We have some people who have taken, because now it's the end of the year and I am Italian, but not to watch, just because I like to know what's happening. Uh, some people who have taken about 10 days more than the, than, they, than the usual at that bracket. And we have some people who have taken two days less than the usual at that bracket. Um, as long as the clients are happy and the work is quality, we don't tend to, to worry about that. And so far, this program has only been live for a year. We've had absolutely no problems. And it has helped us with global recruitment because when you say unlimited holiday leave, everyone gets very excited. Um, we also have very flexible working policies. They can work from home, they can work from anywhere as long as, again, there is notice and, and we plan around that. The other thing that we do is Facebook, uh, is Workplace by Facebook. So we've launched that fairly recently as well, um, which is almost like an internet, but there's no kind of setup costs, and it connects everybody globally. So much more, uh, many more conversations are happening globally than there were before, because now you can just connect with someone in the other side of the world fairly immediately. Um, so those are the types of things that we that we're doing and that, and that do seem to work. But, I, but my stand on this is that we really do need to develop and be committed to that training. Because even though I've just hired three people from different markets, now that we've done that, the goal is that the next level of directors will be from Hong Kong because we'll have put so much effort into, into that training. And the global mindset um, does, for us specifically, depend on the client needs. So even though we have international clients, if they are marketing to a local audience, then that might not be something that they really care about. But as a global agency, we need to have global standards of service, and we also need to have the global mindset so we can predict trends for clients here. Um, and the last thing I will leave you with before I completely drone on is something from Harvard Business Review, which I love and isn't a client, but um, I very much recommend reading for the leadership. Um, and business articles, but I looked at what a global mindset really is and what it requires, and this is what they think. So a global mindset, according to Harvard Business Review, is number one is intellectual capital. So global business savvy, being cognitive, complex, understanding cognitive complexity, and having a cosmopolitan outlook. 
Number two is psychological capital, a passion for diversity, a quest, um, a quest for advice and self-assurance. Number three is social capital, which is intercultural empathy, interpersonal impact and diplomacy. Now, not everyone is going to have those skills for that global mindset, but um, and not everyone wants to, I think we need to understand that as well. But if we can craft training around these three areas, then that really should help to develop what we want in candidates and, and teams that have that global mindset. Thank you, Jenny. Mitya, maybe you can add your thoughts. Um, I know you've, you've got a lot of experience with different companies. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Um, yes, I, I guess I noticed to add to the introduction you gave, um, I uh, set up my business leading organizations about six years ago, um, and it focuses on two areas. One is um, leadership and the other is team effectiveness. Uh, and certainly in, in all the work I've done as a consultant previously in my corporate career uh, with uh, Reuters and Dow Jones around the world, I certainly saw a lot of impact of um, having a global mindset or not having a global mindset on performance and on effective, effectiveness both as a leader or as a team. Um, but I'd like to actually approach, and when I, when I saw the title Global Mindset in particular, I, um, I might focus more on that than, than uh, innovation. When I saw the title, I did think very much about another area of activity I'm involved in, which is with uh, HKUST, and Sean Ferguson just spoke. Um, and there I do a fair amount of work with MBAs, and in particular on um, an area of uh, what I call cultural authenticity, or how do you, how do you work effectively in a global um, uh, work, uh, workplace. Um, and, that, and, and in that area, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, research today now about how or the qualities that people need to be effective in a global world and in a global workforce. And that's something that really is becoming increasingly important as we become globalized. Um, and perhaps even to some extent now becoming a little challenge as some, some countries move away from, from globalization uh, view. And the elements there that, that I think are fascinating is that um, in terms of culture, we tend to think very much in terms of stereotypes. So we tend to talk about you know, whether it's American way of leadership or a Chinese style of leadership or a you, know, you can know German style of leadership, um, which I've probably experienced because my wife is German, so I have a challenge there. Um, but I think, I think the, 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 the thing that puzzles me to some extent, I think is quite important, is that we have a very simplistic view of culture when it comes to global workforces. Yet, compared, in comparison, we have quite a complex view by now of, for example, personality. So a lot of companies that I work with, um, which are all in the multinational space, uh, you will find teams and you will find HR, um, talent management, or, or organizational development and learning and development uh, resources Become, have become quite sophisticated about personality, but they're very unsophisticated about culture. And so I think the area that, I, that I'd like to spend a bit of time on is, is how I think we could become more sophisticated about, about culture in terms of uh, the way people interact and collaborate in global workforces. And I think that's as, as relevant to Hong Kong and, uh, and uh, Hong Kong development, Hong Kong. Um, in resources as is any other part of the world. So the challenge, um, based on all of the research, is that instead of looking at it in terms of stereotypes, we should probably look at it in terms of uh, behaviors. And there are, there's, there's quite a lot of research by uh, a professor called Aaron Meyer, who's based in INSEAD, who has done some very interesting work, a lot of it's on Harvard, actually, Harvard Business Review, uh, on collecting um, a set of five, a, seven or eight different key behaviors that you would expect to find great differences across the different cultures of different countries in the world. And it could be things like um, the way people react to leadership and hierarchy, or the way people react to direct or indirect feedback, or the way people take decisions, or the way people, for example, uh, view punctuality. If any of you experience punctuality in Germany, to take that example again, Arriving one minute late for a meeting is, is a major disaster. Whereas in India, where I've lived and worked for many years and therefore can say this, 
it's quite common for the time of the meeting to be the time you receive the call from the person you're meeting saying, I'm on my way. So there's quite a big difference there, and in both cultures that's uh, acceptable or unacceptable uh, behavior. So Aaron Meyer is taking these benchmarks of different behaviors that are very different across different cultures and then mapped against those what is the stereotypical view or norm of behavior in each of those cultures? And so there is a point on each of those marks, on each of those lines for uh, different uh, different cultures. And then you you apply that to people, to global, to the global workforce. And I've, I mean, the work research she has done shows a conclusion that I've done that work myself because in the MBA classes that I teach, uh, I run this survey. I've probably run it through about 150, maybe 200 students now who all come from the global workforce because they are mid-career, uh, predominantly Hong Kong or mainland Chinese, but certainly also international. Uh, and they've all taken this survey. And the results are quite stunning because you will find, uh, taking the group, for example, of mainland Chinese, that the spread across these different benchmarks or all these different behaviors is very varied. And you'll find some who are very close to the stereotypical Chinese view of hierarchy and leadership. And you'll find others that are completely on the other extreme and very close to the American view of leadership, which is very different, by the way, from, from the Chinese view. And so I think that is really the direction we ought to be going. We ought to be thinking in terms of specific behaviors that are relevant, not all behaviors are relevant, but specific behaviors that are relevant to being effective in a leadership or in a uh, team environment in, in, in the global workforce and to be becoming aware of what those behaviors are and understanding the benefits or, or, or challenges of a certain kind of behavior in certain situations and taking a stepping away from the stereotypical view of when I go to uh, China I need to behave like this and when I go to America I need to behave like that. I'd like to just, I don't, I'd like to stop there because I think a lot of the value will come from questions, but I'd like to finish with a, a small anecdote which uh, I always find um, illustrates this very well and I find quite, quite, quite funny actually. And it's very relevant to Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, if you are a foreigner here or an expat and you either arrive here or have been here, you are quite used to, and that's very widespread, to present a business card with two hands. And we do that as a foreigner because we believe that's the way the local population, the Chinese population, uh, receive or, or perceives our respect for, because that's the way it's done here. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's fine. But it does, the reason we do that is because we want to show respect to the local culture. But it does get rather strange when we do that amongst each other as foreigners. And when we start giving that business card with two hands to each other. Because I certainly don't want to show respect to Anna for the fact that I'm in Hong Kong, I mean, she's, you know, we're not Chinese. <laughs> so I think if you start digging below some of these things, you begin to find a lot of confusion around um, cultural perceptions based on stereotypes and how, in fact, they're not very constructive or helpful in, uh, in, in creating a better environment for leadership and collaboration. Thank you. I think it's probably a good time to talk to Brad. We're very lucky we have a lot of researchers here. And, and I know Brad has done a whole heap of research about leadership. Um, and maybe that's a good time for you to, to pick up with yours. OK. Um, yeah. Uh, so after Anna tried to pronounce Huawei and butchered it, just butchered it, <laughs> let me, let me uh, I'm thinking maybe people don't really understand what Huawei is here. Huawei is China's largest non-state-owned company. It's China's largest global company. So we do more revenue, profit, people outside than any other Chinese company. Uh, it's about 265,000 employees. It's bigger than IBM right now. And I'm the, <coughs> excuse me, I'm the advisor to the head of human resources. And I'm also in charge of the, uh, the HR people. The, the, I'm kind of like the principal of the school for 4,000 HR people in Huawei. So um, my, what I want to say today is, is a little bit different um, from what these guys are saying. Not, I, I agree with everything they're saying, but it's just different. I'm going to go higher higher level than they did. Than they did. Um, <clears throat> I believe that for Chinese companies, 
one of the most important economic issues is to make themselves employers of choice in countries throughout the world. That's my, that's my assertion. Now, in 1987, I started my di dissertation in industrial organizational psychology, and I spoke Japanese, and so I was going to do it on Japanese management, because Japan was like booming. It, it, was, it was booming. They were buying companies all over the United States. The Americans are starting to panic, thinking we're all going to work for the Japanese. And so I decided to do a, a, a dissertation looking at asking the question, can Japanese companies manage Americans? Okay? So I, I decided to do it. There were only two academic studies at that time that were on, on uh, automobile manufacturing plants, but nothing on services. Well, at that time, Four of the five largest banks in California had become Japanese owned. So I decided to do that. So I got in my car and went to um, Los Angeles, where the bank headquarters are. And in every case, there was a tall building in Los Angeles. And on three floors of those buildings, there were only Japanese, all smoking, you know, and all speaking Japanese. And all the decisions were made on those floors. Now, when you go to the, um, the retail branches, the, the retail people like these new Japanese owners a lot, but as you got higher and higher in the organization, they didn't like it at all. And the people at the top would say, I'm going to quit, I hate this place, because I never can make decisions anymore. Now you ask the question, it's 2017, how many Japanese banks are there in the UK, in America, in South America? I think there's just one. Uh, 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 Mitsubishi, uh, IFJ, and it's a very, very small one in America, very small. Essentially, there's none. Does anybody here do business with a Japanese bank? Does anybody here do business with a Japanese insurance company, Japanese brokerage, Japanese credit cards, anything in financial services? Does anybody do anything? Guess what happened? They failed. Oh, well, let's think about this. Let's, let's go up a, another level and say, who does business with the Japanese services company? Does it be education? It could be consulting. It could be financial services. It could be hospitality. Okay, so now let's say, does anybody do bit? If you if you look in America and you ask, or or Europe, does anybody do business there with an Asian services company? They will tell you no. We've never heard of an Asian services. So then go up, up one level further and, and ask the question, how many, Asian, sir, how many Asian companies, period, are employers of choice in countries throughout the world? One is Toyota. Another is Sony, but Sony's quickly dying. And that's pretty much it. If you look at the top 100 companies for MBAs in the United States, that's it. If you look at Glassdoor.com ratings, you would be shocked what I'm showing the Huawei executives uh, on Wildcatblaster.com. It's the, the Asians, so if you look at the um, uh, willingness to refer a friend, Google 92% willing to refer a friend, Facebook 91%, and they have all these companies that are around the 70%, and then way down at the end, there's a clump of Asian companies. They're all Asian, except for Hewlett Packard and IBM, who have not been doing well recently. Okay? So you see the problem? So the question is, can Chinese companies, can Chinese companies succeed where other Asian companies have failed? Why did they fail? Well, they failed for one reason, in my opinion. It's the emperor leadership, or what we call in psychology, core course of leadership. Do what I tell you to do. Um, if you look at leadership styles according to the Hague group, there are six leadership styles. Great leaders are good on all styles. So they can play in different roles. Uh, if, if, if there's an emergency, they can use a coercive. If it's a, this, they can use another. They can use all kinds of different styles. Bad leaders have only one or two styles. Um, and if the Hay research shows that on their, their average rate, that their average scores, uh, Asia scores 68 in coercive leadership. Europe scores 45. U.S. course 39. So that's between 68 and 39, huge difference, right? Now, if I am a young pilot 
and Gene is my 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 teacher. I like a course of leadership stuff. So I want her to tell, do this, do this, do this. I love that. But if I've been doing this for 20 years and she starts doing that, I'm going to kill her, right? So so this is the problem when when you've got. Um, services employees, if you've got manufacturing employees and you tell them do this this way, it's okay, you know, because there's one way of doing it. But if it's a if it's a McKinsey or if it's a Goldman Sachs or if it's a technology company, it's not okay. Now, uh, the second point of this is these days many, many industries are becoming technology industries. So taxis. Taxi industry is going technology well Uber, right? Uh, buses, buses, well, Mobike, you know, you don't take the bus, you just take the Mobike. Um, airlines, Tesla's doing a Hyperloop, right? Um, and then you've got uh, hotels, Airbnb, so see, just one industry after the other is becoming technology industry. That's number one. Number two is that in technology industries, you're either number one or you're a commodity. iPhones, uh, Huawei is now second in the world, in, well, it all depends on the quarter. It's second or third to Apple and the number of phones shipped. Okay, so last year we, we made four phones a second. Think about that. Every second of 2016 we made four phones. So it's a big thing, but, but Apple makes 91% of the smartphone phone profits in the world. They're number one. They take all the profit. Everybody else scratches over the little bit that's left. Um, so, uh, if you have first tier people, you can build first tier products. If you have second tier people, you're going to build second tier products. And, um, and, and finally, the, the key question that I have around this globalization is, you have Huawei, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. These guys, these are the four companies that have the best talent in China. Uh, and they're really smart. China's got a lot of people and a lot of really smart people. However, can these four companies who have China's best talent beat the companies like Google, Facebook, etc., who have the world's best talent? Can China's best talent beat the world's best talent? If not, they're, they're not going to get the profit. Uh, and if you look at companies like Tencent, it's domestic. Alibaba, it's domestic. So there are no, there really, well, Huawei is not. Huawei is the only exception in technology to an, an Asian company that's global. And I tell you, it's not perfect at Huawei, not close to perfect. So and there, there, that's a whole different reason why Huawei could work and that kind of stuff. Uh, but um, I think that's the issue uh, these days. Thank you, Brad. I may have butchered your company's name, but I probably butchered Bernard's proper name. So, um, last but yeah, not least, yeah. <laughs> maybe you can say your name again and um, Ooh, add, your, add your, your valuable comments. <laughs> thank you, thank you, and no problem at all. I'd like to share a different perspective as well. Uh, I mean, building on what has been uh, said before, I would like to share the perspective of the HR practitioner. And most of you in the room are in HR, or most of you are in HR anyway. Uh, so I've created my company, Most Engaged Consulting, uh, last year, building on 25 years, in fact, in corporate HR positions uh, in uh, France, in Europe, and in Asia, in multinational companies mainly. Uh, so my insights today are more about these 25 years of experience of managing global workforce and global mindsets, rather than the last year, which is more around what I do as a consultant, uh, focusing on engagement and the employee experience. Uh, I would say that when I was thinking about how, what is a global mindset finally and how should I define it, and what, what is it in terms of practice for HR people. I think for me, global mindset is, I mean, somebody who has a global mindset is somebody who is local. Local is in mindset. It's a way to, it's a paradox definition, but it's a way to define it. I think in, the, in many, many situations I've been managing in my life, I mean, people from the corporate headquarters call them global because they, they're supposed to manage global situations and global policies, but how many of the headquarter people are really global in their mindsets? I would like to do an audit on that. We would have many, many surprises, right? So for me, global is more about the behavior, to understand, to adapt, uh, to be agile enough to understand, to 
connect with local cultures. So for me, a global leader is somebody who has, and we will come back to the Chinese non-mobility later, which is a problem in Asia, but for the people who are mobile geographically, people who have been moving many countries are usually more global leaders and have more global mindset than the others. That's so, so obvious, right? And you can see that that's for your kids as well, when you have the chance to be at this patch with your kids, that your kids are more global thinking uh, after five, ten years uh, out of their own country than the ones who stay at home. You can see that as well. So that's so obvious. So that's the first definition, and I think the, um, in terms of HR practice, we, we need to look at three things. Uh, the way the company is organized, what is the organization model of your company to create this global mindset. The second one would be more around the leadership skills and leadership competencies you need to develop internally. And the third one would be more about the HR value chain, which is what kind of recruitment strategy and talent development strategy you can, you can put in place. In, on the first one, to, I will be short uh, on each of them. The first one, the organization is very key. I've been working myself in centralized organizations and decentralized organizations, so I have a comparison between both mindsets of organization. And I would say that in my experience, it's only my experience, we can share on that, of course, I tend to think that you develop more global leaders in decentralized organizations than you do in centralized organizations. Why? Because when you are a centralized organization, you, you have a global brand, as you call it. But in fact, if it's a top-down decision process, you develop followers, you develop process-oriented stuff, and you don't develop, in fact, behavior and, and business leaders who really adapt to each country. They just, you know, they just plug in the, the global brand in the local country, and that's it. In my previous company, uh, we had a motto that said, local reach, no, local roots, global reach. Which means we want to have the local roots in each country to understand the country, to, to have country managers who are really independent in their way of adapting the brand to the country, so that creates a mindset of being global. And global reach means, of course, we are a group, so we need us also to be, uh, to be consistent as a group. So I think it's a way to create that. If, if it's a top-down industry, then you don't create global leaders. Uh, and the second perspective is on leadership, leadership skills, and how do you develop this into your leaders? And I think there's one which I like myself as a definition, which, which is a helicopter view. You know the helicopter, uh, which has an ability to do the to have the global view uh, on, on things. So developing the strategic vision, for example, of your business leaders. Strategic vision meaning knowing the business, having a global view on things, and at the same time being a able, like the helicopter, to go down very quickly on the detail, which is in fact being an entrepreneur, being hands-on, being a bit of a dirty job as well. Sometimes not only at the global thinking level, but also doing the job with the teams. That for me, I mean, developing the ability to do that, to do the helicopter in a way, uh, it's something that really creates global. It's extremely difficult to develop, but it is the key one to develop. And you see very few global leaders who are, who are both. You can find great entrepreneurs. You can find great global thinkers in terms of theory, like uh, Boston Consulting Group, I hope nobody in the room. BCG type global leaders, that's one. And then you have entrepreneurs on the field, or on the war scene. Uh, and creating skills and, and finding people, recruiting people, developing people who can have both situations and both skills, it's really, really uh, a diamond that you have, really global leaders, that's one. In terms of HR practice, I would say, let's, let's separate recruitment and development because it's not the same strategy each time. Uh, I would say in recruitment, recruiting global leaders, you have two, two kind of cultures possible. The first one is an integrating culture, which means you recruit graduates, the babies, millennials, you recruit them and you hope that they will stay for life, which they never do, of course. They always leave after two years and usually after the management training program, and I did one myself, as everybody, they leave after that, but we know that, right? So, but, but you have the impression you create global leaders because you know the babies are very international, they are very international-minded mind themselves, they are global in a way. Uh, they are 23 years old, but they are really global. So you think that investing on this population is great because you will create the future executive committee of your company from these babies, right? And you don't, because they, they have been leading for another company in the meantime. But still, it's an effort you, you, you try to do. So that's more, more the model in which I worked many years in companies where usually the executive committee is, uh, the members of the executive committee are 
internally promoted, which means it's a model in which you create a, a, an integration process in which people stay for a long time. That's more the European, European company's model in a way. And then you have another model which is you don't care about integrating. You, you recruit the guys you need at all levels you need. If you recruit a CEO externally, it's not a problem. If you recruit a regional a country manager externally, it's not a problem. And you, you have, it's what I call a competitive model, in which you have a competition between uh, 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 the internal people and the external ones, which means in, in, uh, you have a culture in which it's okay to compete uh, internally with an external candidate. Not all the cultures accept that, but then you can have your global leaders, or you think you have your global leaders by attracting them outside. You, you take one of the top five executive search, and you have, you, have, you, know, you have beautiful profiles, you know. In China, you can recruit uh, beautiful Chinese senior leaders living in Canada for 20 years, being global, because they've been outside, and they come back to China, and maybe they do a good job, maybe not, by the way, because uh, they are not so Chinese anymore. So maybe they are, they are global, but they are, what about the local stuff? So it's not, I mean, you have different models, you have to see what is the best one for your company, but it's not obvious that every, all the things can work. And my last comment would be on the development side, and, and the real challenge for me is how do we develop global leaders without mobility? And that's really a, a challenge for Asia. How do you, uh, and compare it to the question, and, and, uh, the Chinese don't move, the Chinese don't move out, out of China, or they don't move out of greater China. <laughs> um, you know, they can go to Taiwan or Hong Kong, from, from Shanghai, but not much more. Um, I, I have many experiences in my previous companies that we try to do that and we fail all the time, so they, they don't move. Why should they move? And they don't actually understand why they should move to become a CEO. You know, they, in the European model uh, of companies, to become a CEO, you have to move out first, right? You cannot be promoted vertically in your own country as a CEO. You have to go do your experience outside as an expat, maybe one or two or three experience, and then it, it, it creates a global mindset in you that you can become a CEO back home. The Chinese don't want that. They refuse this rule. They want to be a CEO at home. Why, why should not be a CEO by going to Paris or New York first? No, they, they don't want that. So, so we have to manage this, uh, this paradox as well. So sometimes, uh, the way we, we, we managed mobility in my previous companies was to say, okay, let's have a greater China view, do some mobility between uh, China, Hong Kong, Hong, Taiwan, which is already not too bad, okay, creating a more uh, diverse view of things, creating the Southeast Asia mobility, that works as well, Singapore and, and the Southeast Asia cluster, okay, that works as well, but not more. So the way to manage global mindset is more putting global projects on people, which means assigning uh, Chinese leaders to have a, a global corporate project from China to manage for the company, okay, with traveling. That's a way to, 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 to create global mindset. Swapping jobs, rotating jobs between, between managers as well, that can work as well. Putting them into nice leadership programs with INSEAD or HKUST, sorry, uh, I should say that here. Etc. Uh, uh, Etc. Et so that's the kind of thing that you can do to develop that. But still, it's not uh, it's not perfect. Uh, so in terms of HR, I think we're struggling uh, creating global mindset in in, in, in Asia and China. Uh, it's one of the paradox we have to manage. So maybe I'm happy to to share a bit more during the questions. Fantastic. So we have had a heap of information um, from leadership to. Uh, um, elements that they've been doing within um, Jane's company, Golan, the HR perspective, and then obviously around cultural awareness as well. What I'd like to do is immediately open it out to questions um, because there's so many different things that they picked up on. It's really important for us to know what you want to know more about. So please, um, who's got a question? We haven't got Paul, so we haven't got the first question. <laughs> so we're relying on <laughs> everybody else. Fantastic. Hello, um, this is a, a question for Jane and Brad, uh, and maybe a two-part question. First part is, Jane mentioned about training, and Brad, you didn't mention it, but I think Huawei has like an internal academy. Do like training? Well, we have a university, yeah. Oh, oh okay, yeah, yeah, university, even better. So, um, you know, what is like the strategy or importance of finding already what you need and hiring direct, or just kind of not 
what you need, but training from the training programs that you have. Um, that, that's the first part of the question, if that's clear. And then the second part is, would the training ever be strong enough where you don't need to hire a bachelor's degree person? You can just hire a high school and do the training yourself because talent is such a problem. Um, well, I think, so the first, so, sorry, could you just recap on the first part of the question? Um, I, I guess just the, like, balancing hiring what you need versus yeah. developing it with yeah. your training program. So, so I, I, yeah, so I think for us, um, and, and I'm not sure where you're all for in terms of industries, but for, um, for our industry, things change so rapidly in communications and especially the digital space, the ongoing training is a must regardless. Um, but, and we do as much as possible try to hire for what we need. But I don't, you know, again, as industries are changing, and again, emma has been through this with me, you, you're probably not gonna find that perfect person ever um, as much as you want it or the client wants it. So the training is going to be important. Someone once told me, which I do very much stand by, again, specific to my industry, but that you would hire for attitude and train for skill. Because theoretically, you should be able to train people to do, um, to do many things. But something and specifically that I, f that I do find um, across the board, actually, globally, not just specific to Asia or Hong Kong, some people just want a job, want a nine to five job, and don't really care. And then you've got the, the people who will become leaders who have that passion. And the most important thing is that you facilitate that passion, and that you do, you know, your talent mapping, which we do to to identify who those people are going to be, um, and, and make sure that you're giving them exactly what they need to stay. Which does come in the form usually of remuneration, of course, but that mobility certainly we're seeing. Is, is also key to that. So uh, we have now, which we did two years ago, we have three inter-office programs now where the guy, the, the kind of most, the shining stars, if you like, get to go and choose an office wherever they want around the world to go and spend a week or a month in, and then they come back and, and share the learning. So I think it's, 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 it's not 50-50, but, but both are very important. You've got to find that person who meets your requirements as much as possible, know that they're not going to be that perfect candidate, because no one is, and then have that training program to support. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and I, this is a technology company. You can't train people uh, to do technology. I mean, you have to, you, you come in with a professional skill, <clears throat> and maybe it's internet security, and we can teach you how to do your job, the policies, the processes around that, but we're not going to teach you how to be an internet security professional. No way. That's, that takes years and years to do that, right? So, so training is more of how do you apply your professional skills to this particular company's role and processes. That's, that's all, all we're going to do. And I guess that answers the second part of the question was, could you hire from um, uh, high school. Again, I think it depends because a, a lot of, um, yeah, I mean, I could never do your job. I can't turn on the TV sometimes, so me working in technologies is never going to happen. But within my industry, we're very much a, a people industry, and I do know people who have bypassed um, having a degree because it's, that it's a completely different, different skill set. So I think it probably depends on the industry that you're working in. Good morning, and thank you all for a great panel um, sharing of perspective, all very different uh, and still complementary to one another. Um, Brad, I understood from you that one driver of global mindset is really leadership style and specifically in Asia, moving away from that more coercive leadership style. So I wanted to learn more from your perspective, what are some of the, what's a key or some of the keys to moving away from that leadership style? <laughs> a little biased. 
Um, uh, <laughs> how do you move away from a course? That's a really hard thing to do. Okay, so so why why do you have a course of leadership style in Asia? Well, when you're growing up, you have two role models: your mother, who's a tiger mother, and his horses, and your teacher, who's horses. So what are you going to be when you grow up, right? <clears throat> Versus uh, something in America, you know, you only go to school until 2.30 and then you quit and you go out and you play sports and you learn how to do teamwork and you learn how to do strategy and you're in the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and doing leadership things around there, right? So we start learning leadership from a very early age and here they're not. You know, I was, I had an apartment um, <coughs> above the swimming pool in the dorms when I first got there. <coughs> and there was a tennis court below. And I used to look below, no one could play tennis. There's like nobody who could play tennis. You know? And I go out to the swimming pool, there's like no one who could swim. And I'm thinking, I can't do math, but I can swim because I'm an American, right? So it's, it's what, we, what we spend our time in for years and years. Now, as we all know, you can't teach a 30-year-old to ski. Well, I mean, you can teach them to ski, but they're not never going to be an expert, right? And now all of a sudden, you're saying, you bring a person in, and now they're 30 years old because they've been doing their regular stuff, and they're going to teach them to be a leader. And you take them to a, a one one week leadership class. Oh, can be a break. Is that going to make up for all those hours that you missed? So it's very difficult to change that. Now, what you can do, and I spoke with the head of uh, the hate group. I, I wrote an article on this, and I, so I, I I spoke to the head of the hate group and asked her that exact question. What do you do? And she says, well, you can add one leadership style. But you can't change everything. You're, they're always going to be coercive to a certain degree. But if you would just add one style, you know, participate or whatever style, and focus on that, it might be okay. Now, when I was at IBM, I was in charge of IBM, Asia Pacific Organization Effective with Leadership. We had a guy that was an IBM fellow. And he was really high on pace setting, which is, I think we should do it this way. Because he's a fellow, he's smarter than everybody. So he's always telling everybody what to do. And, uh, and for three years, I did little bits of coaching on him. And after the third year, his pace setting score went down. He was so proud of himself that he wasn't a pace setter anymore. So he, it was really hard, but he did. He was able to pull it down and start moving the others up. But it's really hard. Do I think it's... On a, on a large scale, it's possible. I don't know. I don't know. It's difficult. <laughs> Is the answer to that question to be American? <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> but, and do you think? I think that's a great question. And uh, but do you think it's a different? It's different for the younger generation because, again, certainly I see um, across our offices in Asia, you, you you do have some old leadership practices. But the, the ones that are coming up, the younger kids have a completely different mindset. And I wonder if in maybe 10 years' time there will be that generational change. We're doing a, a study right now at Huawei. Uh, it's going to be the largest millennial study ever done. 90,000 employees, only Chinese. And it's, we're just finishing the data collection right now. We'll have a better understanding about that. But I think you're right. I think that, you know, uh, the people my age all grew up on farms, not knowing if they were going to eat tomorrow. And the younger people at Huawei, virtually none of them have grown up on farms. And so is that going to impact the way they are motivated? I, I really think it is. Yeah. So, so I'd just like to, to jump in on that. I think it's a great question as well. Um, I, I guess I have a slightly different perspective. I, I think as I, you know, as I tried to explain, I don't think there is one stereotypical leadership style in a culture. And I think that if we, if we go down that route, I think we are running a number of risks. I think one, we're just reinforcing perceptions and stereotypes, and so we continue, we're locked into that mindset. Um, and secondly, the much bigger risk, I think, is simply not true. Uh, and the research uh, does underpin that, that you get a much, much wider and varied and diverse set of leadership styles, whether it's coercive or not, I mean, a whole range of different leadership behaviors uh, across cultures. And in today's world, I think the question that Edie pointed out, millennials or younger generations, absolutely relevant. 
in today's globalized world, uh, socially me social media connected world, internet connected world, uh, leadership is changing dramatically. Perceptions, expectations of leadership are changing dramatically. And you simply have a range of different leadership styles, from coercive to consensual, across all cultures. Uh, and if you were just to take, to step out or, or to, to counter uh, against the stereotypical view, the, the, the number of Indian CEOs, for example, in uh, running American corporations is disproportionately high. And you have to ask yourself the question why, because if you go into the stereotypical view of Indian leadership style, it's very authoritarian. And if you go and work in India, and I have done, and therefore can speak from experience, there's certainly, you'll certainly experience that. However, the reality is that there is a much broader diversity and blend of leadership styles across all cultures, and there are some capabilities that Indian um, leadership brings to leadership, which is very effective in American environment. looking at the, um, the nuances of each culture. I, I've noticed that since I've come to Hong Kong that we talk very much in stereotypes. So I appreciate you trying to break that. Yeah, but I mean, just to just add one point, I think the, you know, if you want to turn it into action rather than you know, just a theoretical theoretical view in terms of, because the question you asked was how do you, how do you change that? I think you have to just try and look at different cultures in terms of different behaviors rather than looking in, in different cultures in terms of a stereotype. And then you're likely to be more open to, to learn and to change, and you're also likely to be more able to appreciate where your behavior might be appropriate or where your behavior might not be appropriate. I'm not sure I, I would totally agree with that, though. I mean, again, uh, Asia coercive leadership style of over hundreds of thousands of data points in 68. Western Europe, 45. United States, 39. That's a fact. And there's also some really interesting studies on the following styles. Um, and I find this at Huawei too, but, but let me talk about the research and not talk about the practical right now. Um, <coughs> Citibank did a study of Asian Americans Asian, not Asians, Asian American tellers, Latinos, Blacks, and Whites, and found that Asian Americans felt that they had less control over their vacation, over customer service uh, activities, how they could respond to the customer service, than the other three races. And then they re-ran the study, and they said, well, let's make sure we're just looking at the same manager, because maybe they had different managers. And they re-ran the study, and they found the same thing. Stanford did a study <clears throat> on seven-year-olds, and they would get they would they would do an anagram. An anagram is where you take a, a word and the, the letters are kind of jumbled up, and you have to figure out what the word is. And they had the the, the kids would choose the whether they want to do people anagrams, uh, car anagrams, animal anagrams, etc. They had to choose their the category, and they would have to choose the color of the pen. That was condition one. Condition two is they would say, your mother took to ask you to do the animal anagram or people whatever and told you to do the red pan or the blue pan, something like that. The mother actually was never told, okay? They found that the, the, um, the this was Stanford University, the Caucasian kids and the, and the Latinos and the blacks uh, did two and a half times better when they chose their own categories and when they chose their own color pants. The Asian American kids did better when they chose, when their mother chose for them. Okay, now this is important to, to understand. This is not Asians, this is Asian Americans. These are kids that were born. So there is a cultural influence. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody is the same. It doesn't mean, of course, but on average, there is a, there is a difference I think on the on back to the practical side, I think it, whatever the cultures, whatever I mean the values and the style, etc. And Mitya, you're right to say it's a question of behavior as well. And I also think it's a question of you've got two kinds of people in the world. People who are good with people and people who are not, honestly. Some people, whatever the culture, they, they know how to do with people. And some they don't. 
It's about, not about culture, sorry, it's about what you are. Some people are, are gifted for that. They have the empathy, they have the, and they have the way to, you know, they, they, want, they know what to do with each person according to the person. They, they really have this sensation of what to do. And, and you can see that in, in China, in France, in, in, in UK, in US, in every country. So uh, in terms of practice as well, I mean, through leadership practice internally, you also have to detect these people or to develop them or to recruit them, uh, 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 but I think it's also transculture and transformative. It's, it's maybe the case against virtual cultural diversity uh, it, to be a bit uh, controversial. So I think it's also back to that at the end of the day. Uh, it's also, as a leader, as a global leader, are you good with people or not? Are you, are you able to engage them, to embrace them, etc.? And some are good at that and not. What about the culture? What about the, uh, the research, etc.? So I think it's a really strong case I would like to, to, to give as well, as well on the table because it's, uh, it's not only about this cultural thing. So. But can somebody in, 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 in France be a good leader for somebody in the Netherlands and not be a good leader for somebody in China? Are they different? I would say no. Say, uh, uh, 80% no. Uh, maybe there are some slight differences, more slight than we think. Uh, I think uh, a good leader with people uh, uh, would know how to adapt to the culture he's going to. Uh, in my previous two companies, I had the experience of that. We had, we had managers going around the globe and never going back to France, like expat for 20 years. <laughs> five years in one country, five years in another one, and then they continue in or the orbital management <laughs> around the globe. right? So you can see, you can observe the, the practices and, and the really gifted guys, we, we had the best ones. And they, they were good at, they arrived in country, they learned the language in two months, then, or maybe not Chinese, huh? <laughs> but I'd say, let's, let's say Greek, let's say Italian, let's say I mean, many languages that are easy, easier to, to learn, right? And they do that and they know what to, uh, what to do the first week, the first month, the first year to, to get people, the buy-in from people, to get people love them. And they do that anywhere. And you have this kind of people. And that's what I call global leaders. That's my definition of what is a global leader. What do you think? I feel like that's when it comes down to the individual, which maybe at an agro level you could you could assess as having certain behavioral traits as a leader to be able to adapt to different cultures and connect with people who have different backgrounds than you do. Um, I feel like if I kind of take an integrative view of everything that you guys have shared, it's that there's a time and a place to look at someone as an individual and being sensitive to the different behavioral traits that they may have that are not necessarily because they're from one culture or another, um, but there's definitely a time to look more collectively um, at, at a culture when making maybe strategic decisions um, for a business. So I think you're all right in your own ways. My moderator. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Just, just one, one thing. I was in. I've been in Japan for five, seven years actually, and did fine, did, did okay. And I've been in China for eight years, did okay. And then I was in one year in the Netherlands. Oh my gosh, I thought I was going to die. Oh my gosh, I thought I was going to die. Every day I go in, they, they, they complain about Americans. Oh, uh, and they fired me. <laughs> so, um, so I'm not sure. Do do I want to go back to Europe and take it? No, <laughs> I don't think so. So I'm not sure that it's just this one characteristic that I can go to every country and just be fine. I'm not sure that it's that simple. But it but it is about. See, I'm with you, and I'm not, I agree with all, with everything because. I think you, there's no arguing with the data, and I believe that. I'm a big believer in data, but that is taking a fairly sweeping view. It's not, it doesn't mean that everyone from China is going to be coercive. It just doesn't. And we, in our company, we have some amazing leaders in China who are, frankly, much better than me, um, who, according to the data, should be... Um, should be less coercive, but I do think it's on an individual, almost on an individual basis, and, it, and it's more about about that behaviour um, and, and that person than, a, than lumping it into one kind of big statistic. But to build on that, it's, it's also dynamic, right? So it's changing, it is not, 
if we, if we rely on the data and say, well, this is the way it is, and we go with the mindset of, this is what I'm going to expect, this is what I'm going to find, but it's actually changing, it's changing very fast because of, because of a number of, in particular, social media influence, but also globalization, travel, and you know, the connectivity that exists today. So what was uh, a style of leadership five years ago, um, based on the data, is a completely different style of leadership today. I'm just going to add something there. Um, that's um, actually what's, I guess, is really interesting. We're talking about building the workforce. And I deal a lot with students. And I think one of the big challenges we have here in Asia is that people try and build the students to be global. But they're picking up some of the, the skills in leadership that maybe were suitable uh, many years ago. And they're not necessarily picking up. So I see a lot when I go and help with uh, group assessments and helping them get through those sorts of um, activities, I see a lot of the time them being encouraged to be the alpha person in the group and to be um, pushing out other people's ideas when we all know that isn't necessarily what we would perceive to be the global leader that we need. Um, so I think that's probably something. I don't know if anybody's got anything to add on that or any experiences. No, I agree. I think. Um, again, a, a lot of my, a lot of our, our lot are quite young, and I think dealing with them versus with dealing with my executive directors who are kind of mid forties and from a range of countries, it, it's more about um, their age actually than where they're from because this lot actually do quite like strict guidelines and being told what to do and yada yada. This lot just want to do whatever they want, and that's. And that's a, a big challenge, but I also love it because it, you, we should be letting them figure things out and, and giving them training, but figure things out and, um, and test and, and not be as this group, I find, are quite restrictive. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it, it's more about that and the way, the way they're from, certainly from my perspective. We have about 10 minutes left, so another question. That one fed a whole load of debates. <laughs> See if we can do another one. Hi, uh, thanks for a very inspiring um, sharing. And uh, uh, talking about the cultural side, I'd be interested to know because I do have a situation that someone from the leadership team is the first time coming to Asia. And the um, team, um, before I came, is quite actually a local one. So that the person thinks that it has a problem, but probably that person is it's not um, he does not re realize that he has a cultural sensitivity issue, but honestly, it definitely hinders his performance. So mixing the cultural side and the performance side, as an HR, as a new HR, I observe that, and I do want to help the person. Firstly, how could I uh, bring this topic to him delicately? And secondly, what should I um, what should I tell him like to, to foster his growth and everything and to break down all his cultural barriers? I, can I take that one first, just because <laughs> I have a little bit of experience in that. So, and, and so I've been in Asia for five years, and when I came here, um, and, I, and I started work in a, a different agency that I'm, that I'm at now, I came in with my UK hat on with, everything you're doing is wrong, this is not strategic, we're not efficient, you're not doing this, 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 let's change it all right now. And I was met with a very bugger off, you've got no idea about this culture or what we're doing. But this kind of went on for me, for a blindly, for about six months. And what happened was, one of, um, one of my team members who was, uh, and I also didn't understand what was happening, because I was working until midnight, because I was trying to work with the UK, but I was building a practice, so we didn't really have that much work, and yet everyone sat outside my office, and I'm thinking, what are you doing? Because I know you're not, you've got nothing to do, because we've got like one client. And so I had to figure that out, and they wouldn't go home until I'd gone home, because I was the boss. Um, and so I had to say, do you know what, we're in communication, something's gonna go wrong, we'll have a client crisis at some point, and we're gonna be working 24 hours, but until then, just go home, until we need to bond together. Um, and they wouldn't for a little bit. Anyway, six, genuinely it was six months in, when this girl who was 23 and hadn't, was not, um, was educated in Hong Kong, um, and, and she is actually one of the best 
people I've ever worked with. And this is, she hasn't traveled particularly, but she does have that global mindset, in my opinion, because she wants to learn about cultures and, and, um, and she is open. Um, and she is, she isn't the traditional Chinese view. So she comes in at the age of 23, knocks on my, on the VP's door, comes in and, go, and basically tells me, I need to stop what I'm doing, um, to the horror of everyone outside, because I need to listen to her and I need to um, immerse myself in the culture to truly be able to understand how to make the business better because my Western view just isn't working. And she was 100% right. When I moved, I have taken her with me, um, but now she's, she's somewhere else. And now actually she's moved to, uh, uh, to Shanghai, to Beijing. But, she, but that was really important for me. So everyone I've hired since who's been an expat, I sit them down and tell them my story of, and this is particular, I would say, to Americans that come in and I sit them down and say, everything you know, you're just gonna have to put to one side for a little bit. And now what we do genuinely in Golan with expats is give them a transition program. So, and so the, the girl I've just hired from Dubai, when she gets here, um, she has two weeks of, um, vet, of onboarding from our team. But that also includes her personal time, because we're going to take her out and show her Daipai dogs, and we're going to take her out and show her the tiny spaces that people live in Hong Kong, because everything she knows no longer matters. And so that, that is what we've done in terms of making sure and giving people time to transition but it's now part of the onboarding process because I think once when expats come over, you can't just assume that they're going to know what they're doing, and you are almost setting them up to fail if you don't give them that kind of warning. So in your situation, I would honestly just be brave and sit down and say, I'm doing this for your own good, and it is really going to help your performance, and maybe we need to think about one or two weeks where we look at the areas of cultural insensitivity um, and, and really look to explore those. One of our team, for example, has started a Chinese movie club, and so she goes and watches Chinese movies um, with her team. She's English, so she can get to know what kind of stories are being told, and again, specific to, to my industry. But just trying to live the life of, of the country that you're in, I think, is, is very important. Just like build on that, um, which I, you know, I, I think that's um, very helpful, actually. I think I think that you have a two-sided challenge. So there is certainly a knowledge component, which I think you're talking about. You know, not knowing enough about the culture you're working in is certainly a, a, a stumbling block and you know, holds you back. And if you are new to a culture, that's certainly an area you need to build on. But I think there is a, there is a, another dynamic, which is uh, and this the story you gave, Jane, is is, is interesting because. If we arrive, or people arrive as far as, and they only have their home culture to reference to, and so they try to use that in the way they behave, and then after a while they realize that maybe that's not appropriate. The risk is then to go to the other extreme, and to think, to think that everything in the culture you're now resident in, your host culture, is perfect, and everything that you've learned before is, is irrelevant, which is also wrong, and that's just going to the other extreme. So it's somewhere in the middle, and you want that blend, and the reason that blend is important is really the underpinning reason why we even think global diversity is valuable, which is we want an exchange of ideas, of experiences, of leadership styles, of values to come out in a more, in a more diverse uh, end product. So my advice to you is, certainly I agree with Jane, knowledge building is critical, but I would also add a component which is um, don't lose the openness to what this person is bringing, because they may have some ideas that feel culturally insensitive, but they may be valuable ideas. And that's an input to change in terms of cultural values and global mindset that's happening in Hong Kong. So there's value in listening, even though it may be uncomfortable, to some of the things that you're, that you're hearing. What, what we did in my previous company is that we, uh, we proposed some package programs in terms of multicultural uh, dimension for people who, who were sent abroad. Like uh, if you go to China, if you go to India, if you go to Greece. Uh, you, we offer the two days program for you and your family and your spouse and sometimes your kids about what are you going to find in this country in terms of, of etiquette or way to do with that being too simplified. And what we always did as well for some, some reasons is to train the team, the team that is going to receive the new manager from abroad. 
I mean, the local team, what about like, this team? If you don't train this team as well to, to be sensitive to the guy arriving from, from, from you know, another country, then it's, it doesn't work. I think it's good to train as well, or to educate, or to, you know, to, to find a way to, uh, to, uh, to give some sensitivity as well to the teams locally to receive well an expat, I would say. Uh, we always do the only one way, which is you, we train you to, to, to understand what is China. What about how do we train Chinese people to understand what is a French guy coming to be your boss? You know, and I think if you, you work on two dimensions, you can work on a win-win approach, which is a bit more, a bit more, more sensitive. And the last point is that I think in HR we do many mistakes, sending people abroad. For some personalities, we know it will not work, and we do it. So let's let's just stop to do that. We know that. I mean, 20% of the case, we know. There is a risk, this guy is not going to work, okay, we have to move him anyway. So it's also back to the HR mistakes we do sometimes in, uh, in, in appointing people. I, I hope it's not your case, in, in your case, but that happens. And I think that's a really good point and not something I, I thought about actually about the receiving team. Because they, if you're bringing an expat in, um, there is that, and again, just from my experience, but there is the teams will think, well, why isn't it someone from Hong Kong? Um, and we've had issues um, with teams and actually clients who just don't like guaylos and they don't want to hear what, what I have to say or one of the other guys on the team um, just because they just don't, don't like it and they don't think we understand the culture. Now, fair enough, there, there is a massive valid point in the fact that I'm not from Hong Kong, so I don't know. But what I can give you is the right strategy for your business, regardless of where I'm from. Um, and I think sometimes I've found that they react like that because they, or they think, um, unfortunately, because of what I did and many expats do, they automatically assume you're going to come in and say, I'm, I know what's right. And I think we place so much value on trying to fix things sometimes that actually it's just about listening. And if the teams, you're saying to the teams, this person's coming in, doesn't matter where they're from, this person's coming in to help you. And so that person, the, the team should be prepped off. This is not a threat, this is gonna, nothing's gonna change for the worse, this is gonna be good. And so prepping them is very important. But with the person who's coming in, I honestly think the best piece of advice given to me by Crystal at the age of 23 was just shut up and listen. Because then the teams can tell you what they need to tell you, and then your, that person's job is then to, to go and help and fix it. But listening, we all love to talk, but listening, I think, is, is key. Uh, it's much easier to accept a nationality from the headquarter, right? I mean, when, if it's a French company, Chinese people accept having a French guy coming from Paris because there's a kind of a, you know, he, we know what he's talking about, and then we maybe learn, we will learn something from him or her, etc. When it's a third nationality coming, it's a bit more difficult. When it's not the headquarter, shareholder, or nationality, if it's another country, then I found in my, in my experience it was more difficult to accept than when it was the, uh, the guy from the headquarter. Just very briefly, uh, basically what, what Jane was saying. I, I did some, uh, sorry about that, you're right. Um, I did something like this at IBM. <coughs> at IBM headquarters, it was the storage unit, uh, the storage business unit. And they didn't like the Japanese, they hated the Japanese, always, you know. And, uh, and it, 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 it was interesting that you can't say bad things about other cultures, but Japan's okay, you know. I don't know why that was. So I said, all right, I want the, the uh, executive management team of storage headquarters to come to Japan and meet with the executive management team of Japan storage, right? And day one, the Americans couldn't say anything. They could only ask questions, and the Japanese would tell them. And then day two, the Japanese can't say anything, and only you know it's the opposite. And on day three, three we created a joint plan. It worked, and of course it works. How could it not work, right? And I remember the you know the, the Americans were finally saying, oh, so that's not that's why you refuse to lower the prices, you know, because there's a they're going to buy anyway, and it's going to re reduce your market, etc. But they just never understood because they never stopped to listen. So it's it's different. It's kind of a higher level of what you were saying, but it's similar. 
And with that, I knew when I took on this panel that they would have heaps to say. So I hope you found it hugely, hugely beneficial. We've now run out of time. Um, I'm sure they're going to be around um, for some part of the rest of the day. So if you have anything specific you want to ask them, please do. But in the meantime, please can you thank our panelists for coming along and sharing their thoughts.